All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Jordans. <laughs> Good morning, everybody else. All right. I'm <laughs> glad you're with me this morning. Uh, my name is Ethan, and uh, I uh, first am going to lead us in a time of prayer. And uh, this is a time where we set aside our, our service to pray for uh, families in our church, pray for ministries in our church, and then pray for things going on in the community. Um, and so here's a few things that I'd like to pray for this morning. Actually, I'm uh, filling in for my wife. She was supposed to do it, but we have a child sick at home. Summer's like, why, why get sick in the summer? But it happens. Um, so uh, I'm going to be praying for a family, uh, the Bailey family, um, Erica and Chris and uh, Abby and Kendall and Matt. This is Matt. Matt's a little older. I haven't met him yet. But uh, that their family, they have been on vacation. So we're, we're happy for them. They're coming back today. And I want to pray for them because uh, I think they have a busy season coming up in the next few weeks where... Kendall goes to camp, and then Abby goes to college for as her, uh, for her freshman year, and then the school year starts and things will get busy. So I'd like to pray for the Bailey family, as as uh, you know, school. I don't want to say school too soon, but we are thinking of it. Uh, school. Oh, I see all these students here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, to talk about schools, uh, but it's it's a reality, right? Uh, the second thing I'd like to pray for is, um, as Nicole mentioned, we have our Vacation Bible School uh, in a week. And uh, this past week, we had multiple opportunities to pass out invitations to uh, a lot of people. Um, a few of them were some uh, food drives uh, that families came to. We were able to pass invitations out. There was the um, splash pad on Friday. There was the Eagle Street Beach Party yesterday. So a lot of invitations went out over the past few days. And so I'd like to just pray for people to respond and come uh, to, to BBS, uh, to, to just enjoy, take, take part, and uh, for kids to hear about uh, God, how God loves them and wants to be their friend. And then the third thing I'm going to pray for is, I didn't see it, maybe you saw it, but there's a big hole out in the road here uh, yesterday. I guess there was a water main break. So I just want to pray for the DPW. They were probably there working all day long. And so why not? We can pray for those that serve our community in that way. All right? So let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Thank you that we can join uh, together in prayer to you. Thank you that you are a God who knows us, you love us, and you, you want to hear from us. And God, we uh, ask for uh, the, the families of our church. We ask, ask for the Bailey family. Thank you for them. Thank you for them being a part of, of our family here. And um, we pray as they finish up their vacation today that you would give them safety coming back. And God, as, as they have big things coming up, Kendall camp next week, Abby goes to school at the end of the month. And... Um, the school season starts back up and, and, and jobs and, and the bakery kick, kick back in. I pray that you would just bless them, help them, give them strength, give them perseverance as, as uh, the busyness of life continues. And I pray that you would just help them to walk with you and, and help them to rest in you too, Lord. Um, Lord, I pray for the, all the invitations and the connections that were made over the past few days. Uh, for uh, Vacation Bible School and uh, families invited, people hearing about it. I pray that, and ask that you would help these people to respond and to come and to enjoy and to take part. And God, that the people would feel cared for and loved by our, our, our churches in this community and uh, hear about the good news of Jesus and what he has done for us and how he, through him we can have friendship with God. <clears throat> and I pray that uh, you would help these families to, to get there, and uh, may you um, uh, allow it to, to happen and, and do the maneuvering that you, you can do, Lord, to get people there, and um, give us strength during that week and, and your blessing as we serve, and as uh, many of our people attend and kids, kids and the youth attend and enjoy. And Lord, I thank you for the services in our community, like the DPW, and I know many of them were working 
yesterday and, and police and trying to fix problems with the water and, and uh, I pray that you just bless them and give them uh, an extra blessing today of, of uh, rest or if they need more work done or finishing cleaning up, I pray that you would just help them and uh, thank you that uh, we have people that can um, take care of our communities and serve and um, just watch over them. And uh, we ask that you would just uh, bless them and their families today and, and the work that the, that the community does, services like that. And God, guide us in our time with you this morning in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, I get the privilege to speak today again um, on our series uh, in, uh, up for that we're, we've been calling Paradox and looking at the upside down ways of following Jesus, all right? Now, uh, let me just kind of catch you up on what is a paradox. Many of you probably have heard that word before, maybe you haven't, but a paradox is a seemingly absurd or contradictory statement. So when you look at it, when you hear it, your eyebrows go up, your ears tingle, and it seems not right. But when investigated and studied, may prove to be well-founded and true. And the paradoxes in, in the Bible give us a new perspective for life with Jesus and a new window to see our lives through and also to live our lives through um, these paradoxes. All right, so the paradox that we're going to be going through today is the last will be first. Okay, the last will be first. Now, uh, to set up this paradox, I want to go over a little bit of history with you. Um, any history people, like you enjoy history? No. Okay, there's a few of you. All right, I see you. Uh, I, I enjoy history. My son Asher, who's uh, home sick, he enjoys history. We actually went to um, Hill Dean uh, in Manchester. Is it Manchester? Manchester, yes. Manchester, Vermont, which is Abraham Lincoln's son's summer home. Uh, we went there this week and checked it out. Very cool. So we, we are, I'm, I'm a history guy, and uh, but I want to go over some history with you. All right, Tanner, if you can put up that uh, uh, little, what we call the gospel matrix. So this is, uh, I want you to see this to get a picture in your mind to get us to the paradox. And we're going to think through the story of the Bible. Now, this may be familiar with you, uh, the breakdown that, that, uh, that we have gone through before uh, of the storyline of the Bible. There's multiple people that have done it multiple ways. This is like uh, four movements. Um, there's, I've seen some that are seven. I've seen some that are nine, like breaking the whole Bible down into chunks to where you can understand it. So, so knowing some history. Maybe this is totally new for you, and that's good too. But the breakdown of the story of the Bible is, as you can see up across the top, creation, fall, and then redemption, restoration. And I'm, I have, like, I'm sorry that the Isaiah thing isn't there. I didn't realize that that was in there. <laughs> I put that together this week, so forget that. Here we go. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And this helps us get a framework of the history of God, the history of the Bible, and God's work in time and in the world. Okay, so I'm going to go through this real, real quickly, and we're going to get to the Christ event in the middle, and then a little bit into the redemption part uh, as we look through this paradox. Okay, so creation. At the beginning, God created all things. They were good, beautiful, and just right. God made everything, and he also made humans in his image, gave them life and meaning and purpose in their place. So at the beginning, creation, God made everything, and he made it just the way he wanted it to be. But then we have the fall. The fall is where sin came into the world and broke what was made. Many of you know the story of Adam and Eve uh, disobeying God, eating of the fruit, and bringing sin into the world. And sin came and shattered 
what was good. Sin came and shattered man's relationship with God. And then there was, so there was separation. Uh, and there was a gap between God and man. So we have creation, then fall. Everything went wrong. All right? But there's hope in the midst of this brokenness, in the midst of this shattered world and shattered relationship with God. God came and made a promise that it wouldn't always be this way. Even in the early part of the Bible in Genesis, he promised to uh, ascend a, a person. He promised to enact this rescue plan to fix what was broken. And as part of the plan of God, uh, God promised a, a, a person who would come and make the world right again. And he started this plan by creating a certain people, a nation, the nation of Israel, uh, who would carry out this plan. And that through this nation, the promised one would come. So a lot of the Old Testament is uh, the ups and downs of that people, Israel, and co coming about the promise, uh, f um, the promise that was made, understanding and seeing the story of of these people and of the generations and, and their ups and downs, their rights and their wrongs. All right. Um, God had promised to send a king to rescue and rule and reign over his people to forever. This king and kingdom would bring freedom and hope and prosperity to the people. So, so the people in the Old Testament were looking for it. They were like, where is this one that we, that God promised? And he, God made multiple covenants and promises like <laughs> He's coming. He's going to be like this. He's going to look like that and, and look for him. And so they were looking. They were they were ready. Obviously, he uh, not not he, but the people did a lot of damage. They, they weren't the greatest and most faithful people, but God's promise was still there. Then finally, in the early pages of the New Testament, God's plan to send the king and to bring the kingdom to bear on earth was coming about with Jesus. That right there in the middle of the Christ event. Jesus coming to earth, born and lived his life, and he was here. What the people had anticipated and waited for thousands of years, the son of God, the king, the, the rest, the one who was going to be the rescuer, he was here, and he starts to minister and to teach and do a lot of things. And his followers couldn't believe that it was happening. He had come to rescue them, to save them from captivity, from the struggle, and from uh, even the ruling power of the day. And he was going to set up God's kingdom on earth. So Jesus was here, present among us. And he began to embody this kingdom. He began to teach about this kingdom and what it means to be a citizen of, of this kingdom. And so as Jesus' followers believed and started to follow him, they started to discuss and worry about their place or position in this kingdom. And we're getting to the, par the paradox now. They were, they were discussing who is the greatest about importance in the kingdom. And what they thought about greatness and importance in the kingdom was different from what Jesus' idea about greatness and importance were. So Jesus teaches this paradox. Okay, the, This paradox, the last will be first, is in multiple places. And so we're going we're gonna to look at a few of those. Okay, So... so let me just quickly remind you where we're at, okay? So the king had come. He has bring the kingdom to, to earth, to bear. And he, the hope was here. The rescue was, was here. And now the, his followers say, oh, I can't believe it. It's happening. And now, all right, who's going to have these different levels or of importance and position in the kingdom? All right. And Jesus' teaching is going to teach them the, le the lesson of the last will be first. Their idea of, of, of importance was place and position and prominence, earning it and being first. They struggled with this, and we're actually going to read the, the passages in just a second. 
They wanted to know who was the greatest, who was the most important on this team, and how do they be prominent or first. But Jesus' idea of place and position and prominence was different than what his followers were actually thinking. Place and position and prominence in the kingdom of God is being last. Importance was having a heart and life of service. All right. And so let's look at a few passages and first see the disciples' dilemma. All right. The disciples' dilemma. So go to uh, Ma Matthew chapter 19 with me. Thanks for sticking through my little history lesson there. But let's now get into the, the, the stories of how Jesus approaches this paradox of the last will be first. So Matthew chapter 19, we're going to read this one first. Then we'll get into Matthew chapter 20. So Matthew 19 Jesus was just answering the, a question from a rich young man on how to inherit eternal life. And Jesus had challenged him to sell his possessions and give all the, the, his proceeds away to the poor and follow him. But the, the man said, no, I, I can't do that, and he ran. And Jesus now, after this teaching, uh, talks to his disciples in verse 27, Matthew 19, 27. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you in the new world, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So Jesus here is te was teaching the disciples the cost of following him, and then and they said, Jesus, we've given up everything. What like, what else do what what then will we have? What else do we have? And Jesus says, in the new world, in the new creation, at the end of time, you will serve with me and reign with me in in my kingdom. And he is, says to them, uh, but many who are first will be last and the last first. What, what Jesus is teaching here is that importance is not based on who they were or what they had. Like greatness is, is not based on who they were or what they had. Jesus says many who think they are the greatest are the most important based on what they or who they are or what they have are actually last thinking of the rich young ruler and those who are last will be first all right um T, if you can go to the next uh, slide i thought this was really helpful to read it in a different uh, translation of this last verse to get jesus what jesus was saying here when thinking about the people, the the, uh, the disciples were struggling with who they were or what they have in importance, Jesus was teaching them differently. He, he says, uh, but many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. That gives us an understanding of this last will be first. And what in the eyes of Jesus and the eyes of his kingdom, those who think they are the greatest now are not, will be least important then. And those who think they have the least or, or they are who, who they are the least will be um, the greatest then. So here's one of the, the disciples' dilemma is the, the fighting of importance based on who they were or what they have. Then Jesus goes on again in, in chapter number 20. Let's, let's read that. He's gonna, so he says the last will be first like three times in this passage. So we're going we're gonna to look at that. That was the first. Here's the second. Matthew 20, 1 through 16. Jesus teaches with a story like he many times does. 
So Matthew 20, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard and going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. All right, so let me catch you up here. So there's a um, owner of a vineyard who goes out and into a marketplace and hires people to work for him. He goes out at the beginning of the day and he says, hey, hey you, group of people at the marketplace, I'm gonna give you one denarius a day if you come and work for me. They said, yeah, all right, let's go. And then he goes out three hours later at, at nine o'clock. And then he goes back out at 12 o'clock and gets some more. Then he goes at three o'clock. And then it's, he, it says he even goes out at uh, five o'clock in the day, one hour before like shutdown time. And he hires these, uh, these people to come and to work for him in, in the vineyard. And then it's time for payday, all right? In verse 9, and when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. So those who were hired one hour before quitting time, all those got a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. All right, so those who were hired at the beginning of the day also got one denarius. What do you think they thought? What would you think? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's say um, here, here's a here's a little example. Okay. Um, I say Nate, I'm gonna I have a vineyard which I don't, but I'm gonna hire you for the whole day and I'm gonna pay you a hundred bucks. All right. Cool. Not not lots. You right? <laughs> All right. Then I go to Mike and I say, Hey Mike, uh, I need more help. It's five p.m. but we're, and we're closing at six but I still need a, uh, some help. I'm, I'm gonna pay you a hundred bucks for that hour. Nate, how do you feel about that? Cheated. There you go. <laughs> Unfair, cheated. Like, dude, I worked all day long. What's up with that? All right. Now here is, um, <laughs> uh, on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying the last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. And then Nate's all nice and tan for being outside all day, right? But, but he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give, to, uh, I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. All right. So, so we, we knowingly, like admittedly, we say no fair. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's not, you're cheating. But the owner says, I am being fair. You agreed to work for me for a denarius a day. Doesn't he have the right to do uh, with his money with what he wants. He is still being generous. And this is a picture of, of the kingdom of God with, um, with his people, All right? This is the vineyard is, uh, the vineyard owner is God. And the vineyard is, is his world. And we, we are the hired laborers. And whether we have, um, and when you think about it, whether we have uh, worked and, and strived for a hundred years, or whether there is some that has worked and strived for a year, God is generous and gracious to all. And, he, he, and we, we in our own mind think, that's not fair, that's, that we deserve more, but we are not God, and we need to trust in God's grace, God's sovereignty, and his generosity on how he chooses to 
use people how he chooses to bless people and reward them in the life to come but there's a paradox here he says the last will be be first these were uh the hired workers they were basing their importance and greatness on what they did right well i worked all day and this guy only worked an hour the workers were occupied with thinking of what they had done is what made them important it was almost a works-based mindset a merit-based like well i've done this so don't i deserve this but jesus flips the idea upside down and says the last will be first he is a gracious and generous god to those who have been doing it for a hundred years or those who have been doing it for a hundred hours living for him you know so, so for us many times the with the idea of envy or jealousy or even of merit, um, we, we, that stirs within us, but we are recipients of God's grace and generosity. The last will be first. It's a, it's a change in, in our thinking of, of what we do. It's not based on, our life with God is not based on what we do. It's based on his grace and generosity with us all right and then continuing in the passage jesus foretells his death in verse 17 to 19 and then he's going to teach this paradox again the last will be first all right here here's a here's a fun one verse 20 to 27 then the mother of the sons of zebedee came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him she asked him for something and he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered uh, to the sons, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it is, has been prepared by my father and when the ten heard it they were indignant at the two brothers uh, but Jesus called to him and said you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them and it shall not be so among you okay I'm going to stop right there so we have uh, a mom coming with her I, this, is, this is interesting right um, I don't know how you feel about this Mom's coming with her either teenage sons or like early 20 sons to Jesus and says, hey, hey Jesus, uh, I got a question for you. Um, what's it going to take for my sons to sit, both my sons to sit at your right hand and to your left? And Jesus says, are they prepared to, to go my way and to suffer like I will suffer? And, and they say yes. And then Jesus says, you will uh have that path in your life but for, that's not for me to grant who will sit at my right hand or at my left okay um and the, the other disciples they were upset at james and john and their mom for for going to jesus and asking that question so jesus calls a family meeting all right come on disciples everybody get in and here i'm going to teach you something more about the last will be first he says, uh, he talks about the, the rulers of the Gentiles lord over the people. They, ex they exercise authority over them. So leaders of the world abuse their authority over others. They flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different, he says. So here's another dilemma. They, the, the James and John, they wanted a place. They wanted a position, they wanted to be great, they wanted importance, but Jesus says, it's, you're not gonna be like the Gentiles in the world, it's gonna be different. He says, but among you, it will be different. So let's look next at the Jesus solution. All right, see if you wanna hit the next one, the Jesus solution. How will it be different? Jesus says, It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Serving. Bottom line. Bottom line there. 
power and greatness and importance in the kingdom of Jesus is taking a place of lastness. Not firstness, not greatness, but being last by being a servant. All right. What is Jesus's solution to um, trying to have importance by who you were, what you have or what you do? All those things that we just looked at. It was by having the mindset of lastness and serving. Jesus says in Mark 9 35, he says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus is redefining the disciples idea of importance and greatness. Remember that history? They were like, Jesus is here. We're going to have a place. And we're going to rule with, with him. And we're going to, we're going to have, we're going to be great. Like we're going to be first. This is going to be awesome. But Jesus is redefining their idea of importance and grace, uh, greatness from firstness to lastness. Hopefully that makes sense. Greatness in the kingdom of God is serving. Greatness in the kingdom of God is serving, taking last place, not prominence or fame or notoriety, but humbly serving. True power was what they wanted, the disciples wanted, and these people wanted, they wanted that, like, I'm, I'm awesome, true power, but true power is displayed through self-giving love, service. Jesus teaches us that those who go last, those who are quietly and faithfully serving, they are first in the kingdom of God. They have that firstness. Jesus sees them as most important. And Jesus says then now in the next passage, he, he is that way too. He came to serve. Jesus says, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, I'm going to redefine all that you're, you think and all that you know and what you're going for, for greatness and importance. And I am the one that is showing you what lastness looks like. He came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life. The one who had the place and authority given to him, the position of prominence, he came to serve. He came and was last. And Jesus didn't come and demand, all right, everybody serve me because I was the son of God. No, he came lowly and quietly and humbly served others and then died like he was, as he was last, like he was last. He took last place, the lowest of low. He came and died a cruel and shameful death on a cross. He, uh, the servant, died for us. He gave his life as a ransom for us, for our sin. And as he is the servant, then he was vindicated as Lord over all. He, he, he took last place, but then he got first place. God gave him first place. God raised him above all names and above, uh, raised him over all as king of kings and lord of lords. But he had this mindset and, and, and attitude of a servant. We just looked at Philippians uh, over the past few months in the spring. And Philippians 2, Jesus took the form of a servant we, we've read and, and studied many times, and he became obedient to the point of death on the cross. So Jesus shows us the, this example of the last will be first. Our, our, so our pull for importance, greatness, place in the world, and in the family of God is changed by Jesus teaching us the last will be first. Jesus teaches us that those who go last, who faithfully serve, those who, are, uh, who aren't striving for greatness through who they are, what they have, or what they do, but they humbly serve, are first in the kingdom of God. Jesus is uh, reshaping now us today, our 
our priorities and values. All right, can you go ahead and put up the uh, picture there? All right, we do live this way, right? That's right. Now, some of you may have no idea what this is, okay? But this is a, from a movie, and it's uh, it's funny. But uh, <laughs> how, probably like 15 years old, maybe 20 years old. Yeah. Um, but we have this mindset: if you ain't first, you're last. All right. In in our in our day and age, and in our minds, like if if I'm not first, then I I'm last. We 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 live this way. All right, and we're fight, we fight against it. Jesus changes our, reshapes our priorities and our values. Okay, so how does he do that? I'm just going to recap and then we'll be done. So he's reshaping our priorities and values by reshaping our perspective toward place and position in life. Redefined what power is. Power is not being first. Power is being last. Serving and uh, uh, giving and, and showing love. You know, do we really uh, need to be in a place of greatness, a place of entitlement, in a place, well, I deserve this because of what I have done or what I have or uh, who I am? You know, do we really need to be recognized as important? Jesus reshapes. Uh, our idea of power that we can be last and that's okay Jesus also reshapes our attitude towards being served and serving others redefining uh, that greatness is love and service our mindset now can be as we look at this paradox that how can I lovingly serve those around me I don't have to be first. I don't have to be most important. I don't have to be great. How can I lovingly serve those around me? How can I uh, be self-giving with the love that I show to others? And this um, applies all over our life, okay? Um, I'm gonna pick on the kids a little bit, all right? So the idea of the last will be first. So kids or teenagers, that means, um, when you're fighting with your brother and sister about what show to watch, right? The last will be first. I'm gonna give preference to them. It could be there's one scoop of ice cream left in the carton and me and my brother want it. I'm gonna show deference. I'm gonna love my brother or sister and serve them and let them have it. Then you're like, well, no, I'll let you have it. No, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have it. But, but, Think of that. So kids, you can do this. Students, you can do this. The idea of the last will be first. This idea of greatness and importance is not like, all right, I need to be the most important in life. And it, it, it's gonna, I'm, I'm gonna do that at any cost. No, Jesus says, lastness and service is good in the way of Jesus. So think about that, kids and students. Like, where in that, where in your life does that play out? Okay, it could be with your sibling, could be with your mom and dad. It could be like, oh, they ask you to vacuum something, and you're like, oh crap, can't you do it, mom? No, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put myself in lastness. I'm gonna serve. That's that's uh, that's how we can apply this. With moms and dads and marriages and, and ch our church family and employees and, and employers, like this idea of uh, lastness. I'm going to put myself uh, as last so that I can serve others because that's the way of Jesus. And uh, what I want to do is just ask God to remind us every day. Maybe th that would be your prayer like this week. God, where in today can uh, um, I be last? Show me how, can I, how I can serve others. From the littlest thing to the big things. How can I live out this paradox of the last will be first? I don't need to be important. I don't need to be great. I don't need to have a sense of entitlement because of who I, who I am, what I have, or what I've done. 
It's the attitude of God, you are gracious and generous to me, and I can be I can put myself last and serve others. So this promised king who had come to bring redemption and freedom, that little history lesson of God's people, he came and brought God's kingdom to bear on earth, does things in a different way than what the disciples expected and what we expect of the idea of power and importance and firstness. It was not of having a, ha having a level and doing things and be, uh, um, being prominent and great by what you have or what you do or who you are. It's by you show greatness and prominence by coming last and serving others. This is the upside down way of following Jesus, uh, being last rather than being first. All right. Hope that uh, hope that makes sense, and hope that clicks in somewhere with you. Uh, the last will be first. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you. Um, many of these paradoxes are are hard to hear. 